Good evening, everybody. I'm Father Edwards, pastor here at Mary Mother of God Parish in North Scranton. I'm happy to be joined by Dave Rajeski, who serves as our diocesan, or our parish uh, director of pastoral planning and the head of our RCIA program, and Marie Purcell, who is our director of religious education for our young people here in our massive parish in North Scranton. This is a simple little um, opportunity to try to reach out to people across the diocese, even across the country, to do a little bit of ongoing adult education. Obviously, the pandemic has made everything difficult today, and people are not able to come together in a, a large gathering of any sort. So this affords us an opportunity to cover some points that many times Catholics simply do not understand and sometimes feel they have no way to get an answer to their questions. So we're going to cover some basic points. Nothing here tonight is going to be particularly difficult. But maybe it most might spur you to do some further reading on your own, especially in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, readily available online or in book form. Last year we had a program called Mary Mother of God Reads, where we gathered a rather large group of people and covered a, uh, an encyclical by our Holy Father. Unfortunately, the pandemic brought that end, uh, that, an end to that program, which we were enjoying very much. This program does not give you the chance to call in questions, as we had in our fall offering on divorce and remarriage and women who had abortions. But if you do have a question, you can call our rectory, Mary Mother of God, 342-4881, or Facebook a question to us for next week. We're happy to answer your questions. If you have them, somebody else probably has that same question. For seven weeks, we're going to be covering the sacraments, kind of basic stuff that every Catholic should know the seven sacraments, but oftentimes there are thorny questions that maybe people don't have an answer and don't know where to go to get an answer to that. So we're going to try to help just some basic points, nothing too deep, but maybe you'll leave here thinking, hmm, I got something out of that. Next week, we'll do confirmation. And that's the order in which the sacrament should be received, baptism and then confirmation. I'm sure that's one of the points we'll cover next week. Over the seven weeks, which will take us well into Lent, we'll have covered all seven sacraments. So we hope you enjoy this. It's free. It's convenient. You can watch it at home. And so let us pray as we begin. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God bless us. In this ordinary time, as we head now towards the great seasons of Lent and Easter, in this time of COVID and compromises to our liturgy and such a difficult time of suffering for so many and death for so many, help us seek to know our faith a little bit more deeply, that we may follow it a little bit more closely and love you a little bit more dearly. We make that prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. So, ladies and gentlemen, I turn the mic over to Dave, who runs our RCA program. He's going to cover some basic points and questions about baptism. Dave, if you would, please. Thank you, Father. Um, as Father said, I work with RCIA, and what I'm going to talk about is some of the things that we discuss when we have a new group of people coming into the church. Uh, basically, it's going to be five points about baptism. And the first point is that baptism is a sacrament. Um, in the Catholic Church, we have seven sacraments, and they are really meetings or encounters with Jesus that give us grace to share in, in his own very life. Think about some of the Bible stories that you may have heard of people who met Jesus. They're transformed in that meeting, and that's the kind of meeting that a sacrament is. We encounter Christ and we're transformed by him in this. Sacraments establish our relationship with God. And Christianity really is all about having a relationship with God and coming to know him and being changed by him. A lot of you who are probably of you know, my generation remember at your confirmation the bishop came and you answered questions that you memorized, and one of them was, what is a sacrament? Sacrament is an outward sign instituted by Christ to give grace. We all, you know, stood up and said. And it's true, but we need to think about it. The, the sacraments are meetings with Jesus, but it's not like we're making an appointment to see him at 2.30, and he'll be there and we could have a chat. These meetings are, 
are done through signs and symbols and ritual. And so the signs are important. But they're a little different than normal signs. These are signs that cause what they signify to take place. For instance, if a stop sign was, were a sacrament, when you were driving along and you came to a stop sign, it would cause you to stop, all right? And sacraments are like that. The, uh, through these signs, for example, through the Eucharist, we become the body of Christ because that's what we receive. So the sacraments bring about what they signify. Second point on baptism. It's the one sacrament that all Christians share. For Catholics and for Orthodox Christians, there are seven sacraments. Um, you know, baptism, confirmation, Eucharist, etc. And But when the Protestants broke away from the Church of Rome in the 1500s, they rejected most of the sacraments except for baptism. It's the one that all Christians have held on to. So when we have someone in our CIA, one of the first questions that we ask is, have you been baptized before? And if they haven't, then we make arrangements for them to be baptized on Holy Saturday. But if they have been baptized, they don't get baptized again. You receive the sacrament of baptism only once. Why is that? Because we believe the sacrament of baptism leaves an indelible mark, a character. We're forever changed by it. In baptism, God gives us his life. We're grafted onto Jesus through our baptism. You know, we become one with him in his death and in his resurrection. Once God gives us that life, he's not going to take it away from us. It's ours forever. We may not be open to or follow the mission that we receive in baptism in our life. We may even reject it, but God's life is with us always. God doesn't go back and reject any of that. So for that reason, we receive baptism only once. There's three sacraments that do that. Confirmation and holy orders are the other two that, that are received only once. Sometimes there's confusion with people. They think, well, matrimony, you know, for Catholics is only once. You could be married more than once. Matrimony ends when one of the partners dies, you know, or if there was an annulment, someone might get married again. So mat matrimony could be received more than once. But baptism is a one-time thing. Okay, our fourth point, baptism is a sacrament of initiation. There are three of them, baptism, confirmation, and Eucharist. These are the ways that we become members of the church and share in the life of the church. If you go to very old European cities where there, there's a, a cathedral, a lot of times you'll see a building called a baptistry that's separate from the church. And it sort of sets up the whole idea of how initiation works and how we think of the sacraments of initiation in the church. In the ancient church, baptism was held once a year on Holy Saturday with the bishop. The bishop initiated peoples into the local church. You know, our parish is Mary, Mother of God and Father is our pastor, but the local church that we belong to is the Church of Scranton. Um, and so the bishop, as the head of that church, would be the one to welcome people. People who prepared for baptism would come <clears throat> and they would meet in the baptistry beforehand. In the center of the baptistry was a pool filled with water. And people would disrobe and then they would go completely under the water, come back up and be greeted by the bishop who would then put oil on them, finish the rite of baptism and, and anointing, and then they would go into the church, into the cathedral for the first time to celebrate the Eucharist. At that time, people who were not baptized weren't allowed in a church. You had to go through the baptistry in order to come into the church. And that's why these three sacraments, baptism, confirmation, and Holy Eucharist, 
are the sacraments of initiation. Early in the church's history, adults were the people who were being baptized. Uh, you know, they, they, they listened to the preaching of the apostles and their successors, and they were convinced by the story. They, they went through a period of preparation. They became what we call catechumens, where they worked with someone who was already a Christian, their sponsor, <clears throat> at living the life of a Christian to get to know what it was, and then they came in to the church through the sacraments of initiation. As time went on, people had children, and what do we do with these children? Uh, all of the sacraments and the life that we receive as Christians isn't just about us, it's about our community. You know, if we think about the story of Peter going to Cornelius' home in the uh, Acts of the Apostles, he goes and he has his experience where he learns that God's calling the Gentiles too, and he baptizes Cornelius and all of his household. So all of the family members, the servants, everybody became Christian at that time, even the children. And so that practice was present in the early church, little children being baptized. Because life was precarious for most of our history, we didn't wait until Holy Saturday to baptize infants. They were baptized shortly after they were born and brought into the church that way. And the understanding was that their community, their family, is where they would learn how to live out their faith and how to practice that. And so eventually, infant baptism became the norm, the thing that, that we saw most often practiced in the church. <clears throat> so the priest, like Father Edwards, became the minister of baptism, and the bishop, you know, slowly drifted out of the picture. In the Eastern churches, that's what happens. Baptism, confirmation, and Eucharist are all celebrated with the infant, and the priest confers all three sacraments. In the Western churches, okay, the Roman Catholic Church, they wanted to keep the bishop involved, so they separated the three sacraments. Baptism was done when you were a child. Confirmation was administered by the bishop who came every so often to local parishes and administered the sacrament. And so the sacrament of confirmation was given years after baptism in most cases. Recently, probably 60 years ago or so, RCIA was reintroduced into the church, the rite of Christian initiation of adults. And it's the way that adults become Catholics okay, and receive baptism in the church. And it restored the sacraments of initiation, put the, putting them all together in one event. So if you come to your church on Holy Saturday for the great vigil mass, and there are, there's an RCIA program in your parish, you'll see an adult who will be baptized, confirmed, and then receive Eucharist with the rest of the community. So those three sacraments are held together. Our last point about baptism is that like all of the sacraments, baptisms use signs. And these signs help us to understand something about the meeting, the meeting that we have with Jesus in the midst of the sacrament. They help us to get some of the idea of the spiritual reality that's taking place because we can't see that spiritual reality. So the first sign of baptism is water. And it's good to think about the ancient symbol of baptism. You know, the ancient practice where somebody went into the pool completely submerged under the water and then came up because it conveys some of the meaning that, uh, that the water has. In the ancient world, people, the sailors sailed very close to the coastline because 
water was dangerous, and so you sailed where you knew if you got out too far, there was a feeling that the ocean would swallow you up and that would be the end of it. And that's part of the symbol of water in baptism. Water brings death, so that going under the pool, under the surface of the water, the person dies to their old life, dies to sin. And then when they come out of the water, they're risen to new life in Christ. So even though when you go attend a baptism of a baby, the priest or the deacon will pour the water on the baby's head. The symbolism is the same, that in that water, that person dies to their old way of life, dies to original sin, and comes out a new creation in Christ, having received Christ's life in the sacrament. The second sign is oil. In baptism, we are anointed with holy chrism. A very ancient sign, and we need to like look a little bit about how oil was used in order to understand all of that sign. Think back to the story of the, um, <clears throat> you know, the story that Jesus tells about the two men going from Jericho, and you know he's beaten by robbers and left by the side, and the good Samaritan finds him. When he finds him, what does he do? He pours oil into his wounds. Because in the ancient world, oil was medicine. And so when we're anointed, it has some of that connotation that in receiving the life of Christ, we're healed by that. Oil was used in the ancient world in athletics. Wrestlers rubbed it all over their body as a sign of strengthening. And that's another part of the aspect of oil. Why are we anointed? Because we're strengthened by receiving the Holy Spirit, you know, when we are anointed, so that we could live out this new life that God gives us. And the last part of that symbol is oil was used to anoint kings and prophets in the Old Testament. And so when we're anointed, we're receiving some of that mission to govern our lives by Christ's, by Christ's standard, by Christ's measure and also to prof carry out that prophetic mission to bring Christ to the rest of the world. Later on in the ceremony, the priest or the deacon who's doing the baptism will go to the baptismal candle and light a candle from that, which is then given to one of the godparents. And they're told to receive the light of Christ because in baptism, that's what happens. We receive Christ, who's the light of the world, and he comes to illuminate us and to illuminate our life. And that's part of our mission. We're to take that light with us when we leave the church out to wherever we go and bring Christ's presence to the rest of the world. Finally, the last thing that happens is you receive a white garment. It's a little easier to see on Holy Saturday because the adult is there in their street clothes and they they put on a white garment at our church. It's a, a robe that, that's put on. For a baby, sometimes it's just something that's covering, you know, like a, it looks like a bib that goes over them. But the idea is to go back to that reading of St. Paul, who tells us to put on Christ so that we carry the attributes of Christ with us as we practice this new life that we receive in baptism. So that when people see us and the way that we act, they should be seeing reflected in our lives the way that Jesus acted toward other people. Okay, so that's our five big points. All right, baptism is a sacrament. It's the one that all Christians share. We receive it only one time because it leaves an indelible character and we are forever changed by it. It is one of the sacraments of initiations, the way that we come into the church and become members of that community of the church. And it uses symbols that are rich in meaning that help to explain to us how we receive the mission of Christ in that sacrament. My presentation is 
centered upon children and their families because that's the work that I do. The sacraments are a celebration of God's love for us, and most of the celebrations in our life are with our families. The sacraments include our church family as part of the celebration of each of the sacraments. Baptism, as Dave said, is the first sacrament of initiation. Um, it takes away original sin. The Holy Spirit comes to us, and we are filled with God's grace. Traditionally, as Dave explained, an infant is brought here to be baptized by their family. Um, however, that is not always the case. Sometimes life gets crazy, as we all know, and things don't occur as they normally would. So older children are brought to be baptized. And we encourage families to bring their older children to be baptized. Um, it's nothing to be embarrassed about because it happens more often than you would imagine that it would. Um, there's no age limit for baptism. A person can be baptized from the time they're an infant till however long they live if they choose to be baptized. That's important to remember. Um, if a child is over the age of seven, in order to be baptized, they must learn about the Catholic faith. So they receive instruction, much as the RCIA program prepares adults for baptism, we would prepare a child in the same way if they're over the age of seven. Many times we have had parents come forward, um, sometimes because of a child being baptized and the parent may be non-Catholic or may have no religious affiliation at all. Um, more often, when they bring a child for First Reconciliation and First Eucharist, some parents decide to examine the Catholic faith and decide whether they want to become a Catholic like the other members of their family are. The RCIA gives them the opportunity to do that. Um, in the religious education program, when we teach about baptism, the most important place to start with children is with their own baptism. So once again, we're going back to their family and we'll have them ask their family all the questions about their baptism. When was it? Where was it? Who was there? Who baptized me? Who are my godparents and why were they chosen? Are there pictures of my baptism? And when the children come together in a group, they love to share their experiences of their baptism. And it's a great way for the family to talk about their faith. Um, some children have gone to the baptisms of younger children in their families. So they have that experience to share with others and what they remember about the baptism. Um, they can tell about what happened during the baptism, the rite of baptism, okay? the pouring of the water, the words, I baptize you, the Christian name the child is given. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Okay, the anointing with oil, the white garment, the lighting of the baptismal candle, showing that Christ is our light, a theme that we use a lot with the children, okay, that Christ is their light and guides them throughout their life to look to the stories of Jesus to learn how they should live their lives. And finally, the baptismal vows which the parents and godparents take for the child being baptized. But later on, they will take those baptismal vows in the sacrament of confirmation um, when they receive that sacrament. So baptism is just the beginning of their journey of faith with their family and with their church family. Thank you so much, Marie. You guys have covered some very important questions. I hope those watching at home can maybe review these issues with their own children, or maybe some neighbors they have who don't go to church very often have a child that has not been baptized and don't know what to do, where to go, who to call, can I call? Uh, so Dave and, and Marie have handled a number of very interesting points. I'm going to close this little series, and we hope you find it enjoyable. Share it with your friends. Watch it again with some of the more thorny questions that tend to end up on my desk. And some of these are not without a little bit of controversy. Suppose a 19-year-old uh, girl calls, and she is not married, but she has a baby. 
Very often we get the call from this girl's parents. Will you baptize my daughter's baby? My daughter is not married. Well, in an ideal world, every baby would be born into a very happy marriage and we wouldn't have to face this question. But I would estimate that at this parish, and I bet most parishes, approximately half of all baptisms done are of parents who are not married. That would not have been the case when I was a child, but it's very common now. Of course, we'll baptize the baby. It is our honor to baptize the baby, whether the parents are married or not. Do I have brother priests, friends of mine, who would have an issue with that, to be very honest with you, and those watching this on Filmia, I do. And uh, that pastor runs his parish the way he wants to. I understand that. I'm not questioning him. What I'm saying is that at this parish, and most parishes, the pastor is happy to have that baby brought forth to be initiated into our Catholic faith. Ideally, they'd be married, but in this case, they're not. Sometimes that couple should not be married. They do not have the love that would equal a sacramental marriage, and that's just the way it is. And we deal with the reality in front of us. But, but the, the parents being married is not, is not a decisive factor. What is a decisive factor is are the parents or even maybe it's just a single mom or a single dad, do they have a commitment to raise this child as a good Catholic? The first thing the deacon or priest will say to them is, you've asked to have your child baptized. In doing so, you, you assume the responsibility of training this child in the practice of our faith. It will be your duty to bring this child up to follow Christ and keep his commandments. Do you clearly understand what you are undertaking? In other words, do you have the faith to give to this child? You can't give what you don't have. And it is not uncommon for me as a pastor and those who work our baptismal program to have a, maybe a young person or a not so young person who really wasn't given much faith. And it's difficult to teach or model what they don't have. Okay, we will work with that couple. And I think, I hope every priest or deacon or, or lay team would work with that young family and say, okay, here's... Here's how we can help you become good, devout Catholics. And if it doesn't start there at the beginning, as Dave and Marie said, setting a foundation, it's probably not going to happen later in life. That's an important moment for us is to make sure that when we baptize this baby, you know, we're going to plant a seed, we're going to water it. Whether the mom is married or not is secondary. We like the ideal, but we don't live in an ideal world anymore. The second question, and boy, this is a very common one, is the phone rings. I've asked somebody to be a sponsor, my brother, my sister, and the pastor at their church somewhere else will not give them a sponsor card saying that they're practicing Catholic. I bet every priest watching this series is nodding their head saying, yep, that happens all the time. They ask their brother to be a sponsor because he's a good guy, and he is. Unfortunately, he may not be a very good Catholic. Should he be a sponsor? Should he have been asked to be a sponsor? I spend hours dealing with that sponsor, discussing how can we help you be a good Catholic so you make a good sponsor. Perhaps they move to Philadelphia and in the process of transitions in life, never joined a church in Philadelphia. There's plenty of them down there. And therefore, they've been there 10 years, but the pastor does not know who they are. Perhaps they go and they never joined. I encourage every young person who moves, and a lot of young people move, join a church, get anchored, know the pastor, know the staff, so that you won't get into this, this uh, dilemma. But in any case, if you're, not, if you're asked to be a sponsor, you have to ask yourself, how good of a sponsor will I be? Do I practice my faith? Am I living my faith? Am I a person of prayer? Am I going to be a good role model? for little Tommy or Susie. That, that, the, the question really does not have anything to do with your pastor. It has to do with yourself. And if you're not at that point yet, we can work with you on that to help you become a better Catholic so you'll make an excellent godparent for this child. What parent doesn't want the best for their child? Everybody wants that. We'll work with you. Question three, and Marie kind of touched on this. She was working towards it. Two people get married. One is a Catholic, one is a non-Catholic. 
what should the baby's baptismal status be? That can be a thorny question. That couple got married in, in the church, say here at Holy Rosary in North Scranton, Mary Mother of God Parish. The priest would ask the Catholic to sign a statement that I promise to do all in my power to have this child baptized and reared as a Catholic. That's Maybe the non-Catholic party would not agree with that statement. Hmm, that can be a very interesting situation that that couple, that young man and woman, need to sit down and talk about before they get married so that when Junior comes along, they are prepared. Hopefully, obviously, as the Catholic priest, I would hope that the Catholic is going to do all in his power to have this child raised as a Catholic. Those, are, those can be very thorny issues in family life. The smart couple has covered them long before the child comes along and is prepared to have the child baptized as a Catholic. And very often, and Marie and I were talking about this uh, in the rectory before we came over, sometimes it's the non-Catholic parent who often sees to the raising of the kid, picking them up from CCD class, etc., even though they did not make that promise. Those can be very, these are all interesting issues that I'm covering that can be thorny, but good couples, good families have worked these out. Final question I'm going to cover is, the baby was sick at birth. It, it Maybe it was in peril. And the nurse, doing her job, baptized the baby. A good Catholic nurse would know that, doctor, would know that we should baptize this baby because it's, it's touch and go. Was that all I have to do? The answer is no. The Catholic parent should, should call the, the local parish. Here it would be me. I would not even know that, that that emergency situation had cropped up. We will then bring the baby here and supply the ceremonies. We, as Dave said very correctly, we never rebaptize. But there's more to the ceremony than just the pouring of water. There's all the symbols that they talked about. They're not just fluff. No, they, they blow out the candle. That's how easy faith can be blown out if it's not given attention. And it's important for the young couple to understand that. It's not about getting the baby baptized. It's preparing the baby for a lifelong commitment to Jesus Christ, to know him, to know what he teaches, to know how much he loves us, to know that he died on the cross for us. And the ceremony will make that all clear. And the symbols that Dave and Emery talked about will bring it all into focus. So call your church. We are open all the time trying to help couples deal with these unusual, but no, not too unusual situations that do indeed come up. I could cover a bunch more questions, but I think we've gone long enough to cover the basics that we hope to cover today. This is baptism. Get your catechism. Read through the whole thing if you want. Go to good Catholic sources that will give you the truth. We can't cover everything in this one little series. Uh, and we hope it's been helpful. If you have any additional questions, go on our website, Mary Mother of God. Go on Facebook, Mary Mother of God Parish, Scranton. And it's easy to find us. Our daily mass is, is live streamed 8 o'clock every morning. And uh, it's live streamed every weekend too. Uh, next week we're going to cover confirmation. And Dave kind of kind of led us that why, why do we, we as Roman Catholics in the Western Church do confirmation for teenagers when the Eastern Church does it at baptism? Why is that? That's a good question. And Dave and, and I will cover more of that next week. And then we'll go through each of the seven sacraments and every Tuesday night at 7 o'clock it will show. And um, today was baptism. And we hope you enjoyed this. It cost you nothing. Took a little bit of time. That's all. And uh, we'll hopefully see you next week on Confirmation. Dave and Marie, thank you very, very much for your participation.